Hi everyone, and a really, really warm welcome to the 5 p.m. service here at St. Andrew the Great. Whether you're joining us in the building, it's really lovely to have you, or whether you're tuning in at home. My name's Robbie, I'm on the staff team here. I particularly look after undergraduate students. If you're an undergraduate student watching from home, we're missing you guys, can't wait to have you back. Um, it's lovely to have you all with us. Um, the service will last about an hour. There'll be some stuff from here live in the church and some things that we've pre-recorded. A chance to say goodbye to one of our members of staff, but most importantly, a chance to hear from the living and active Word of God. We're starting a new series in the book of Numbers. And if you're new to St. Andrew the Great, or you're just tuning in for the first time or something, you're really, really welcome. If you're new here in the building, you're really welcome too. We realize that the summer's a time when many people join our um, church family from elsewhere, and it's so good to have you with us. Our first song that we're going to sing together blesses the Lord for all his goodness to us. I once read somebody who said that to bless means to review all that the Lord has done and to give thanks to him for it. When he blesses us, he reviews our needs and helps us. When we bless him, we think of all the good things he's done for us and give him great thanks. So that's what it means to bless the Lord. And we'll do that in the words of our first song. So if you're here in the building, let's stand up together. We can't sing. If you're at home, you can sing along loudly. Stay. 
I'm going to hand over now to Ruby Lou, who's pre-recorded these sessions, to give us some notices and to take us through the next little bit of the service. We will never run out of reason for praising our Lord for all his goodness. And it is amazing that we, from all different backgrounds, have been brought together through Christ in one body to worship his holy name. And as a church family, this coming Wednesday, 5th of August, we have got another opportunity to connect with one another and to learn a bit more about Jesus Christ. And this is our central teaching meeting. This time we have Dane Otland coming to join us on Zoom. He is the author of a new book called Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. I've been reading this book recently during the time I feel flat. And it is such a refreshing book, which takes me to look into the essence of Jesus' character, experiencing again his tenderness, compassion, and grace from chapter to chapter. So I'm so look forward to hear more from Dane about the heart of Christ. Do come along and join us. If you are regular here, you will get a link from the church office nearer the time about the meeting details. If you are not on the church mailing list, please get in touch with the church office and update your information, and you will get an invite. And if you are new, you are also welcome to join this event. As a church family, we would love to help you to feel home here in St. Andrew the Great as soon as possible. So there are at least three ways that you may connect with us further, and so we can help you. Firstly, you may go to stat.org new to let us know you are here and someone will get in touch with you soon. Secondly, right after this service, bring your own coffee, tea or hot water, head to stat.org after church coffee, connect with some of our church families over the Zoom breakup room. And this is a great way to have some quick chats about the church, get to know some people and perhaps their pets too. And if you are able, perhaps for now, the best way is to join us in the church building on Sunday by signing up on stat.org attend. Click on the preferred date that you would like to come, and we would love to see you in person. And for our regular members, do you miss meeting together to worship the Lord? I do. I look forward that I can go back to the church building very soon to meet with you all again. So on that last website, you may go there and just tell us what is the best day for you to come to the Sunday service, if you can. We don't want you to miss out. And now we are going to continue our worship to God through prayer. Stephen Oakley, one of our church family members, will lead us to pray together. In his letter to the church in Rome, St. Paul says, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so before we turn to prayer, we should confess our sins to God, our Heavenly Father. And let us have a few moments of silence to reflect on what we have done wrong today and earlier in the past week. Please now say with me the words of the confession that are, will appear on the screens. All together now. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way and have not loved you as we should, nor loved our neighbours as ourselves. We have failed to do those things that we should have done, and we have done what we should not have done. We have broken your commands 
and rightly deserve your condemnation. Father, we are truly sorry. For the sake of Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past. By your Spirit, turn back our hearts to love you and to love our neighbours. Help us to live godly and obedient lives for your honour and glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In his letters, Paul makes clear that no matter what we have done, we can find forgiveness and that we should truly believe that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners like all of us. Let's now turn to prayer. And we start with the Church of England's collect, or collect a prayer for a collected gathering set for this Sunday. Almighty God, whose never failing providence governs everything in heaven and on earth, humbly we ask you to remove all that is hurtful and to give that which is profitable to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In a week in which coronavirus continues to dominate the news of the world, what is hurtful is most obviously the virus and its effects. And so let us pray, first of all, for an amelioration of these effects. We remember that when shown the tomb of the dead Lazarus, our Lord Jesus Christ wept, but also that he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me shall live, even though he may die. Heavenly Father, we pray first for all the biochemists over the world who are seeking to gain greater knowledge of the nature of the virus and its varying effects on humans and other animals, who are seeking to find cures for the illnesses caused by the virus and who are seeking a vaccination that will be efficacious. Please grant them ingenuity, wisdom and success in their researches. We pray also for those suffering from the virus, asking for a cure and for those who are going to die from it, we pray that medical and spiritual help will be at hand to alleviate their suffering, uh, both physical and mental. As people across the world become bored with the restrictions imposed by their governments, we pray, Father, that you will bestow the gift of patience, especially among those who like to be irresponsible, whether through youth or through their temperament. Heavenly Father, we pray also for the many millions across the world who have become much poorer, who have lost their employment because of the virus, and ask that economies will soon revive so that all who seek work may be able to enjoy the dignity that it brings. We pray also that the vulnerable in our society will be protected, but that those less vulnerable will learn to live with the risks that come with being human, and that schools in the United Kingdom will reopen successfully in a month's time. But Heavenly Father, because you work for good through suffering, we can thank you for the many blessings that you have bestowed on us since March. We thank you for the renewed realisation that humans are not in charge of the destiny of this planet. We thank you for the way in which um, this has made people turn to you. We thank you for the opportunity that many people have had to reassess their lives. And we thank you for the provision of technology that has allowed people to stay in contact often more than they were before the virus struck. And in the life of our churches, we thank you for the increased realisation of how important our small groups are. Mieto Theokorus uh, is one of our long-term overseas mission partners. She's a Greek national who was a member of STAG while studying for her PhD, and she now teaches Hebrew and Old Testament at the Greek Bible College in Athens. She also works to assist women trapped in prostitution and other forms of human trafficking and uh, modern day slavery. And she has just announced her engagement. Paul says that God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, and third teachers. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the existence of the Greek Bible College and for all those who teach in it. And we rejoice that despite the virus, it was able to complete its academic year with courses taken online. We thank you for the lectures and talks that Mieto has been able to give. We pray that you will grant Mieto rest over the summer and renewed energy for the coming academical year and faithfulness to your word in her teaching. And we pray for economic conditions in Greece and elsewhere in the world 
that will allow women to survive without being abused or having to sell their bodies. We pray that you will grant Mieto great wisdom as she seeks to bring the gospel to these deprived and disadvantaged ladies. We pray too for Greece as a nation, that those who reject Christianity can be reached by Mieto and like-minded workers, and that those um, who worship in the Greek Orthodox Church will find a church that will be revived and come to place emphasis not on ritual and nostalgic nationalism, but on a living faith that comes uh, by grace through faith. And we pray for Mirto and for a blessing on her engagement and on her, on her marriage. Finally, we pray for our own church fellowship. Paul said to the church in Corinth, you are the body of Christ. Heavenly Father, when it is harder than ever for our own church to meet as a body, we pray for the coming academical year. We ask that as individuals, none of us will let up on our attendance at church, whether in person or by video online, or let up on our concern for those of our number who are lonely and isolated. We pray that we shall put renewed energy into our small groups, that those who could not previously join groups will continue to take advantage of the technology that allows them to participate. We pray especially for new staff who are joining the church, and in particular those who are coming to work with students. We ask that they will feel welcomed by us all and they will find a way of meeting with the students, even though making new contacts in the colleges will be extremely difficult. We pray also for new Christian students coming to the two universities, and especially that a way may be found for accommodating them in church on Sundays. And finally, we pray for all our existing and continuing staff, and especially for Craig and Vic as they lead the work for 20s and 30s, for Robbie, that he will be imaginative next year in leading the new student team, for Tom, that he will be refreshed after the summer break and ready to lead the work with families, and for Alistair for wise oversight of our whole church bodies. Heavenly Father, we ask all these prayers in the name of your risen Son, Jesus Christ. Our next song is a beautiful song to tell us how much God loves us. His love displayed in sending Jesus as our substitute to die on the cross. Let's sing this song and reflect his tremendous love prayerfully in our heart together. If you are at home, sing your heart out. Do 
such love and so me or thorns compose so rich a things that we have to do here at St Andrew the Great is to say goodbye, particularly at this time of the year, to those of our number who are moving on. And never harder than having to say goodbye to Alex Weston. Alex has been here for seven years as our uh, women's student pastor and she's, well Alex, tell us where you're moving on to. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm heading on to Theological College, so I'm going um, uh, somewhere called Oak Hill, it's in North London, and I'm going there to do um, a three-year um, theology course, so studying lots of things like um, the big, biblical languages, um, doctrine, um, pastoral ministry, um, yeah, church history, a whole load of things. So hopefully it will um, be a chance to build on things that I've um, learned here and gained here, and to uh, be able to equip me for ministry for a long time, hopefully the rest of my life, um, I guess. That's the prayer anyway. Well, that's a tremendous move to make. Alex, you've been here seven years. Um, what, can you tell us what some of the, some of the top things are in a sense you feel you've, you've learnt from uh, mm. our Lord and Saviour while you've been serving here in Cambridge? Yeah, so, so many things. Um, I tried to narrow it down to a couple of things. So firstly, um, just seeing so much more of Christ, um, especially um, when we feel weak, when we, when we are weak. Um, he is um, so full of um, love and care and um, compassion and acceptance of us. And um, I, I think I've just seen more of his, um, his deep desire to help us, um, which has been um, really amazing, really freeing, um, I think, for me. Um, and secondly, something about ministry. So um, I found this verse um, really, really helpful, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 7. Um, so neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. And I think um, sometimes I've not found that easy. I've tried to take too much on myself sometimes. So um, it's been a big thing that I've learned um, more and more to see that... Um, uh, success in ministry is not about um, the result, you know, that's God's job, um, but for us it's to be um, faithful and godly and, and serve the people who um, the Lord um, gives to us, which um, in ministry is, is very liberating. So, yeah, thankful for these things that he's taught me. And you really have served the people that he's given to us. You have been planting, you have been watering, and God has blessed your efforts. Um, Alex, tell us what we can be praying for mm, as I think, we get yeah. ready to say goodbye and as you yeah. move. Yeah, I think, um, pray that studying would help me to get to know God better, um, yeah, and that he would be transform, transforming my character um, through all the things I'm, um, I'm learning, and pray that I'd know that, that God goes with me, that I don't, don't go on my own, and um, I'm quite nervous about leaving Stag, and so... Um, Sorry, we're, 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 nervous, <laughs> we're nervous about you leaving, Alex. That's, that's <laughs> um, yeah, so please pray that I can settle quickly into a new place, a um, new church, and um, find chances to um, serve there. It's a, it's a bit harder right now, I guess, moving church, so pray that the Lord helps me. 
It's much harder. Let's have a prayer for Alex now, and then I want to say a couple of other things. Lord our God, it's in your sheer generosity and goodness that you saved Alex and prepared good works in advance for her to do and brought, us, brought her to join us here in the church family at St Andrew the Great. We thank you for her service among the students. We thank you for the legacy of many who know you so much better, some for the first time, through the planting and watering that she's done. Thank you, Lord God, for her membership of our church family. And we want to thank you, each one of us, for all that Alex has meant and continues to mean to each of us as a friend and as a sister in the Lord. Thank you for the blessing that you've brought to us through her coming. And we do commit her to you now as she makes this move to Oak Hill at such a difficult time. Lead her to a church where she will find vital Christian fellowship and Bible teaching, we pray. Grant that she would soon get to know people at Oak Hill and please provide her with friends there on the spot, brothers and sisters. Uh, who uh, she can look out for and who will look out for her as she gets used to life in North London. We pray, Heavenly Father, longer term for great blessing to Alex from the studies which she's going to undertake. It will deepen her knowledge of you as she gets deeply into your word. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would use this to prepare her for long-haul ministry. Father, once again, we want to say thank you for her. In Jesus' name, amen. And having thanked God for you, Alex, I want to say thank you to you on behalf of all of us. Um, I've already mentioned the way that God has, as the Bible would put it, established the work of your hands, serving amongst the students. There are many. Uh, your ears would burn if you heard uh, what they said about what they've learned and focus and one-to-ones and how they thank God for you. Thank you for being a great friend to us on the staff. Um, I need to do this with my hands, Alex, properly, in the kind of way that uh, you might. Uh, you've been a tremendous friend to us, and uh, you've, at staff meetings, uh, so often you've, you've just asked that gentle and polite and probing question about uh, the, the Bible's take on this or the Bible's take on that. Uh, you've modelled the Christian life to us. Uh, you've been a friend to us all, and we're going to miss you very, very much indeed. Um, I want to say thank you. I want to give you this little cup. We'd beware, I did lick the envelope. Uh, it's, uh, um, just to say thank you very much uh, on behalf of all of us. Uh, and it, Alex, if, I, if we could all give you a hug today, we'd give you a huge hug. But let's instead... I think you'll be around afterwards at Christ Pieces and possibly might pop up on a couple more Sundays before you head south down the M11. Now then, uh, Sarah Roberts is going to read tonight's Bible passage to us. Um, please be turning. Uh, if you can find a Bible, if you haven't yet got one, uh, they're at the back on the trolley. Numbers chapter 10. Um, as Robbie mentioned, we're beginning a new series this evening in the book of Numbers. So Numbers chapter 10. Sarah. Okay. Um... So before I read the passage, I'm going to pray for us and for Alistair as he preaches. Our Father, you promise that whenever you send your word out, it will not return empty, but will always accomplish the purpose for which you sent it. Please, as we hear your word read and applied, would you accomplish all your purposes in us? In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so um, the passage again is Numbers chapter 10, verse 11 to 36. On the twelfth day of the second month of the second year, the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle of the covenant of the law. Then the Israelites set out from the desert of Sinai and travelled from place to place until the cloud came to rest in the desert of Paran. They set out, this first time, at the Lord's command through Moses. The divisions of the camp of Judah went first under their standard. Nashon, son of Abinadab, was in command. Nathanel, son of Zuar, was over the division of the tribe of Issachar, and Eliab, son of Helon, was over the division of the tribe of Zebulun. Then the tabernacle was taken down, and the Gershonites and the Merorites who carried it set out. 
The divisions of the camp of Reuben went next under their standard. Eliezer, son of Shedur, was in command. Shalumiel, son of Zerishadah, was over the division of the tribe of Simeon. And Eliasaf, son of Deuel, was over the division of the tribe of Gad. Then the Kohathites set out, carrying the holy things. The tabernacle was to be set up before they arrived. The divisions of the camp of Ephraim went next under their standard. Elishama, son of Amihud, was in command. Gamaliel, son of Pedizur, was over the division of the tribe of Manasseh. And Abidab, son of Gideoni, was over the division of the tribe of Benjamin. Finally, as the rear guard for all the units, the division of the camp of Dan set out under their standard. Ahiza, son of Amishaddai, was in command. Pagiel, son of Okran, was over the division of the tribe of Asher. And Ahira, son of Enan, was over the division of the tribe of Naphtali. This was the order of march for the Israelite divisions as they set out. Now Moses said to Hobab, son of Rael, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we're setting out for this place about which the Lord said, I will give it to you. Come with us and we will treat you well, for the Lord has promised good things to Israel. He answered, no, I will not go. I'm going back to my own land and my own people. But Moses said, please do not leave us. You know where we should camp in the wilderness and you can be our eyes. If you come with us, we will share with you whatever good things the Lord gives us. So they set out from the mountain of the Lord and traveled for three days. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord went before them during those three days to find them a place to rest. The cloud of the Lord was over them by day when they set out from the camp. Whenever the Ark set out, Moses said, Rise up, Lord, may your enemies be scattered, may your foes flee before you. Whenever it came to rest, he said, Return, Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. Thank you, Sarah, very much indeed. If there were a map of the Christian life, what would it look like? I'm talking about a real map, not one of those mind maps which your teacher taught you at school to help you with your revision, but an actual map with north at the top and a scale and that kind of thing. If there were a map of the Christian life, what would it look like? I think you'd agree with me that if there were such a map, it would be very useful because maps show us what to expect. If, like me, you enjoy plotting trips uh, into the wild, you look at the map first, unless you're mad on the unexpected, to give you some idea of what the terrain is going to be like and how you can prepare. What if there were a map of the Christian life like that to show us realistically what to expect? Well, this evening we're beginning a series, as I mentioned a minute ago, in the book of Numbers, the middle chapters of the book of Numbers, about a journey which the Israelites took across the desert of Sinai more than 3,000 years ago, a journey you can quite literally plot on a map. But it's a journey that's applied by the New Testament to us as if somehow the Christian life itself can also be mapped. And that map will show us what to expect. So please follow with me. Four things to pull out from this passage which Sarah just read. And the first is there's a journey. Chapter 10 of Numbers and verse 11. On the 20th day of the second month of the second year, the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle of the covenant law. Then the Israelites set out from the desert of Sinai and traveled from place to place until the cloud came to rest in the desert of Paran. The 20th day of the second month of the second year, since what? And the answer is, since the Exodus, that enormous Bible event, somewhere between 1400 and 1200 BC, where God rescued the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, took them through the Red Sea and across to uh, Sinai and to freedom. We're now on the 20th day, the second month of the second year since that great event. And here is the map. Good, there we are. It's got a scale. It doesn't have the arrow pointing to the north, but um, north is, uh, is there at the top of the map. They started off on the left-hand side in Egypt, and they moved uh, across the Red Sea to Sinai, there's one or two question marks about the exact route. They went to a place called Kadesh, 
and then eventually up the eastern side of the Rift Valley and across the River Jordan to Jericho. It's been 13 months uh, where we joined this story. It's uh, since the Exodus. They are at Sinai there, and they've been there for 11 of those 13 months hearing from God. He's introduced himself to them. He's spoken to them from the mountain and given them the Ten Commandments, this great revelation of his character, which shows them how they're to live for him. He's given the arrangements of how they're to uh, relate to him with the tabernacle, a tent, emphasizing his presence, which is in the middle of their camp, and sacrifices to deal with their sin, to allow sinful people to live with the Holy God. Eleven of those months have been used making those arrangements and him introducing himself to his people. And where we join the story in our mini-series, they're about to get moving again for the first time since uh, the book of Exodus. Now, if we can have that map back on the screen, please. That map is also, and this is perhaps a surprise, a map of the Christian life. Fascinatingly, the New Testament draws a parallel between those people on that journey and Christians today. And we're going to have to do a little bit of wandering around in the Bibles. If you've got one of the church Bibles with you, could you turn to page 1151, please, to Paul's first letter to the Corinthians and chapter 10. He's writing to some people who become Christians uh, a long, long time after these events. Um, after the coming of the Lord Jesus in the city of Corinth, and he says this, I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that's chapter 10, verse 1, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptised into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Paul is drawing a parallel between Christian, the experience of every Christian and what had happened to those Israelites. They were baptised into the Red Sea, he says. That's a pretty dramatic baptism. Um, I don't want to get into arguments about the mode of baptism. Actually, they stayed remarkably dry in that particular baptism, but they, they, uh, they were baptised into the Red Sea. That stands for the beginning of their walk with Christ. They've been converted. And, he, and Paul parallels that with the, uh, the crossing of the Red Sea out of slavery in Egypt uh, with, uh, for uh, the Israelites all those years ago. And then they drank from the rock, which is Christ. Uh, when Moses struck a rock in the desert, water came out. And it's as if Paul is saying, Jesus was with them on the journey, just as uh, he is with you. Now turn over the page to Hebrews uh, a few pages to page 1203, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 9, 1203, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 9. And in Hebrews chapters 3 and 4, the writer uses the same picture of the desert journey for the Christian life. And uh, this time he's, he's particularly interested in where the journey ended up. And if you have a look at chapter 4 verse 9, he says there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Back in the book of Numbers, the people made the journey and some of them failed to make it to the destination. And the writer is encouraging these people to persevere with Jesus so they will make it for the destination. The land of Canaan stands for heaven. Okay? So if we can go back to the map again, just have that map big on the screen, uh, or maybe it's just small on the screen, but there we are. Uh, the model of the Christian life starts with deliverance from sin, our first conversion, ends up crossing uh, over into uh, the promised land of heaven. And, if we can have the next picture, this should show where we are. You know those maps that you sometimes see in tourist places like Cambridge that say, you are here. Well, you are here. We're here somewhere. If you're a Christian today, you are somewhere on this journey across the desert. Now, if you think that's a strange way to read the Bible, it's a New Testament way of reading the Bible, and it's also a way of reading the Bible that our Christian forebears knew and loved and used a great deal. Most famously in this wonderful book, which I commend to you if you've not read it, this would be a great book to take if you still have a summer holiday to come, The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. Bunyan pictures the Christian life 
uh, by following uh, a person here called Christian from a city which is going to be destroyed to the celestial city. Uh, and he actually even has to cross the river to get to the celestial city, just as the Israelites had to cross the river Jordan. And there are lots and lots of bumps and scrapes and ups and downs on the journey uh, uh, along the way. Indeed, Bunyan himself describes his own experience as walking in the wilderness of this world. So that's a model of the Christian life which sustained former generations. And another famous example of it, this is just to put the thought into your head before we sing it together at the end of the service. Have you ever thought about this hymn? Guide me, O thou great redeemer, pilgrim through this barren land. I'm weak, but you are mighty. Guide me with your mighty hands. And it goes on to, to say, um, uh, to ask God for his help in various different ways. I won't, won't run right through the whole uh, hymn. We can sing it and we see the, the desert journey all the way through, God providing for his people. It ends up with, when I tread the verge of Jordan, that's a picture of our death as we enter into the promised land. Bid my anxious fears subside, death of death and hell's destruction, land me safe on Canaan's side. Can we picture the Christian life on a map? Yes, God's given us one in the desert travels of the people of God. That's how the New Testament reads these passages. And over the next few weeks, as we see the ups and downs along the route, uh, have that picture in your mind. You might even want to make a little map of um, uh, the journey to the promised land. Stick it on the inside of your kitchen cupboard or something like that so that uh, uh, you can um, remember uh, where you are. Now, the second thing to note is that this journey is a very difficult journey. Back to Numbers, please, and uh, verse chapter 10 and verse 12. Now, Numbers chapter 10 and verse 12. Then the Israelites set out from the desert of Sinai and traveled from place to place until the cloud came to rest in the desert of Paran. I don't know if any of you have been to a desert. They are extraordinary places. Obviously, nothing really grows in a desert, and water and uh, food supply from vegetation is largely absent. The term is used in the Hebrew for uh, a largely uninhabited or barren place. Uh, now, I think we may have a picture. Oh, look at that. I couldn't resist this. Okay, so here is a satellite picture from Google Earth of, uh, where, of what it lo actually looks like from space. Uh, the green uh, is the area irrigated by the River Nile and the Nile Delta, lots growing there. It gets a bit greener as you get up towards the Promised Land of Canaan, uh, Jerusalem there, but you can see that the Sinai Peninsula is characterized by considerable aridity. It's a very dry place. And I don't want to go on to give us all a complete geography lesson, but you get the point. It was going to be a difficult journey because it was so dry. And in fact, you read the narrative of the travels and they were constantly short of water. And it was unknown, of course. You and I can flick something like this up on the screen. We can look at the GPS and find out where we are. We can dig out the map. They had no map. It was completely unknown territory and utterly different from Egypt, where they had a uh, uh, constant water supply from the River Nile and lots to eat. And as if that wasn't hard enough, there were further problems which are alluded to in this passage. This long section, which shows the order in which the Israelites were to set off, that's here in the middle of the passage, is a military formation. The word divisions is a military word. The word rear guard, which is used here for those traveling at the back, is a military word because they were to expect enemy attack in the desert. And indeed, they had enemy attack in the desert. They'd already had one uh, in the uh, from the Amalekites in the book of Exodus, and more was to follow. What a combo! Tired, thirsty, hungry, enemies. That was the nature of the journey that lay ahead. And we will see the pressure that this meant that the Israelites were under on the journey in the passages to come. Now, what does that have to say to us about our journey if we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ? We're on our way to heaven. Well, I've already mentioned that this passage is picked up in the letter to the Hebrews, and the, it's every evidence in the letter to the Hebrews that the people that the passage was, the people that this picture was originally given to, were experiencing great pressure and opposition for being Christians, and were being very strongly tempted to turn back, just as the Israelites were. 
But I just, because I've been reading it recently, um, just in my own reading, reading through the book of Acts, I just thought I'd share something with you from Acts chapter 14. Uh, just to make your fingers do one extra little bit of work, uh, walking, page 1109. In Acts chapter 14, uh, we, we read about the first missionary journey that's recorded in the history of the Christian church, where Paul, the great apostle, and his colleague Barnabas head off uh, via Cyprus to some cities in the Roman province of Asia. And it's a really tough trip. And uh, they're opposed, but they preach Christ and they leave a little string of churches like um, beads on a, a, like sort of pearls on a string behind them as they travel. And then when they get to the furthest point, they think think it's time to head for home, but they don't head straight for home. They make the dangerous journey back through all the churches that they've just planted. And in each of the churches, they turn up with a message for the new Christians. Here are Paul and Barnabas. They've arrived. How wonderful to see them again. They've got a message for us from God. Wonder what they're going to say. What would you say to establish these new Christians? Well, the fascinating thing is that Luke, who wrote Acts, only tells us one headline from the message, which is given repeatedly in each of these three places where Paul and Barnabas were preaching. It's there in verse 21. They preached the gospel in that city, won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. That's what they say in Lystra. Then they get to Iconium. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Antioch. Paul, have you got the message? Oh yes, I'll give. Are you going to give us something new, says Barnabas? Perhaps. No, it's the same thing. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. You and I face normal pressures in life which come from living in a fallen world. Job hassles, money worries, sickness in the family, bereavement, relationship issues and so on. But be in no doubt there are sometimes also extra pressures that go with the journey to following a saviour whom the world crucified. We may experience some of those pressures. Nothing like as bad as these first Christians in these three cities. But certainly our brothers and sisters worldwide face them. So perhaps we could have that satellite image up again. There we are. You are here on the dry bit. Uh, you see, that's, that's the picture that Numbers gives us. Uh, it can be tough. And actually, it's really important to get our expectations clear about that so that we don't panic when we face opposition for being Christians. Perhaps you can tell that I'm thinking ahead to holidays at the moment. Sometimes I have the privilege of uh, going with friends or family into the mountains. And one of the things I found is quite helpful sometimes, particularly with people who've not been there before, is to warn them that that it's going to be cold and wet and possibly midgy or uh, all kinds of other things. Um, And I find that if you say that to the members of your party first before you go, uh, they're much less whingy on the trip. Uh, because they know what to expect. They're primed for it. It's not a nasty surprise. And God does the same for us. He's not trying to depress us. Paul and Barnabas weren't trying to grind these poor Christians down. They're saying, this is what to expect in the Christian life. There will be times in a world which crucified our Saviour when the going will be tough. Don't think when it happens that everything has gone wrong. So that's the Next thing to say, there's a journey, it's going to be a difficult journey, but, and there's a tremendous but at this point, please notice this, back to Numbers 10, but the Lord is with them. And we see this strongly emphasised in this passage. Yes, it mentions the desert twice, it mentions the military formations necessary to deal with the enemies, but it also wants, we also stressed here is the fact that the Lord is with his people. Verse 11, on the 20th day of the second month of the second year, the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle of the covenant law. What cloud? Well, the cloud was the presence of God with his people, a great pillar of uh, cloud by day, and then it had a kind of night mode, a pillar of fire by night. And this pillar stood for the presence of God with his people. And it was normally above the tabernacle, which also stood for the presence of God among his people. Let's have a picture of the tabernacle. There it is. 
Uh, that's not one I made earlier, but it's one I found a picture of. Uh, the tabernacle was a, a tent built to God's exact specifications, which contained the most holy place, which is the symbolic earthly dwelling place of God. There it was, uh, with uh, altars for sacrifice outside. And it was always set up in the middle of the camp to emphasize that God was right in the midst of his people. So in a double way, both by the pillar of cloud and fire and by the tabernacle, God is stressing to his people that he is there with them on this journey. The whole tabernacle was designed to be mobile. It could be taken down and uh, put up again in the new place, uh, emphasizing that God was traveling with his people. And as the cloud itself lifted, the people were encouraged to travel with the cloud, with God's. And then at the end of the passage, verse 35, whenever the ark, which was the, uh, kept in the, in, the, in the tabernacle with the tablets of the Ten Commandments on it, whenever the ark set out, Moses said, rise up, Lord, may your enemies be scattered, may your foes flee before you. That's about the, the enemies. But whenever it came to rest, he said, return, Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. God was to be with his people. Now we're going to see as we follow the exciting story of the book of Numbers on the next few Sundays that there were times when they doubted that the Lord was with them. Even with all that, they were asking the question, is the Lord among us or not? But without giving you a plot spoiler, uh, the proof, uh, well it is a bit of a plot spoiler, but it's such a, an obvious thing that you need to know it anyway. The proof that the Lord was with them was that they did eventually arrive at the promised land of Canaan. But notice, please, the double nature of the Christian life. We're not, God doesn't save us out of the problems. He doesn't give us a problem-free ride, but he's with us in them. Problems and presence. Problems and the presence of God. There's a lovely him written in the 19th century where the writer describes his own experience in these vivid ways in this vivid way days of darkness still come over me sorrow's path i often tread but the savior still is with me by his hand i'm safely led actually just this week i came across this quote from um, bishop jc rowlin his book, Practical Religion, it doesn't have a great cover, but it's got great contents. And this is in a chapter called The Best Friend. It's about how the Lord Jesus is with his people always. Can I read it to you? The Lord Jesus goes with his friends wherever they go. There is no possible separation be between him and those whom he loves. There is no place or position on earth or under the earth that can divide them from the great friend of their souls. When the path of duty calls them far away from home, he's their companion. When they pass through the fire and water of fierce tribulation, he's with them. When they lie down on the bed of sickness, he stands by them and makes all their trouble work for good. When they go down the valley of the shadow of death and friends and relatives stand still and can go no further, he goes down by their side. When they wake up in the unknown world of paradise, they're still with him. When they rise with a new body at the judgment day, they will not be alone. He will own them for his friends and say, they're mine, deliver them and let them go free. He will make good his own words. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. It might be that we're at a time of facing a bit of uh, uh, opposition for being a Christian or for holding to the standards of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then we get a card from a Christian friend sharing a verse to encourage us. And we see behind that the encouraging hand of the Lord Jesus himself. Or we find the Bible speaking to us in our sufferings in a luminous way. And we're so thankful for his encouragement of us. Read Christian biography. Again, that's a, a, a plug for holiday reading. You will always find in the biographies of Christians, at both tremendous challenge and evidence of God's keeping power through Jesus, that double aspect of the Christian life, problems and the presence of Christ, always together. If you belong to Jesus, he is with you today, not with a pillar of cloud and fire, but by his spirit, He's with us. Whatever the trials, remember that nothing can separate us from his love. 
And now a final thing from Numbers chapter 10, which is also here. This journey is well worth making. Now, if you come down to verse 29, we meet Hobab. He's not exactly a household Bible name, but he turns out to be Moses' brother-in-law. Let me introduce you to him. Moses said to Hobab, son of Rule the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, we're setting out for the place about which the Lord said, I'll give it to you. Come with us and we'll treat you well, for the Lord has promised good things to Israel. So Moses is saying to his brother-in-law, will you come on the journey with us? He wasn't an Israelite, but he was related to Moses by marriage. They got to know each other, and Moses is saying, I want you to come. The thing is, Hobab probably felt a little bit like some of us might feel. Might think, well, that's a difficult journey with all these hassles along the way. I'm not sure I really want to go. He, he answered, no, I will not go. I'm going back to my own land and my own people. Not sure about joining you lot on this great journey across the desert into the unknown. But Moses said, please don't leave us. You know where we should camp in the wilderness and you can be our eyes. Moses had a reason for wanting to uh, involve Hobab in this trip. He was an expert on that region and knew how to, uh, uh, how to make camp and that kind of thing. But then he makes him a wonderful promise. If you come with us, we will share with you whatever good things the Lord gives us. Twice there, both at the beginning and the end of that little interview, Moses promises his brother-in-law the good things that God has promised. Interestingly, Numbers doesn't tell us whether Hobab came or not. But when we get to the book of Judges, we discover that Hobab's family has indeed come. They turn up and they get an inheritance in the land, the territory of the tribe of Judah. They get the good things that are promised. Hobab and his descendants would have learnt it was well worth making the journey. For you and me today, be in no doubt that it is worth making this journey. The Lord Jesus is not does not save us in order just to put us through impossible situations all the time, but to bring us at the last to the land of rest he's promising. It's not that long ago when we were looking in morning church at the book of Revelation. Listen to this. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Will you join? If you haven't joined already on that journey, and if you have, will you seek God's strength to persevere? Let me leave you with something. I started at the beginning talking about a map. Um, have a look at your left hand. Okay, I'm just giving you this. You've got a portable map of this journey, right? Your thumb is the Nile Delta. If you do this, Okay, this is just uh, this is slightly crazy, but it's helpful to remember it, okay? If you've got very knobbly uh, knuckles, then you can make a little bit of a gap for the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea down here, okay? If you can see that. Uh, this is the Mediterranean Sea. You started there. If you're, if you're in Christ, you're with him, and he's with you in this desert journey right in the middle of your palm. One day you'll go up your long finger and cross uh, over into the promised land that God's given you. When the going gets tough, dig out your left hand, have a little look at it, and remember where you are on the map. Let's pray together. Lord our God, thank you so much for the book of Numbers and the way that the New Testament reads it, and for this map which sets our expectations. And thank you that although the journey is tough, you are with us. We thank you for this picture of the double nature of Christian experience, problems and presence and that the journey is so well worth making and that you have good things promised for those who come on the journey. Sustain us with these thoughts, we pray. Calibrate our expectations correctly and help us every day to remember, particularly when things are tough, that you are there with us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Alistair. We're going to sing that song that Alistair mentioned, Guide Me, oh, that great redeemer. It's got a great 
tune, which means it's a really memorable one. I'm looking forward to people in the building humming the different parts. But if you're at home, I hope you'll join us too. Let's sing together. pretty much brings us to the end of our service. If you're watching online, then please stick around. There's after church coffee. Just go to stag.org slash after church coffee and join in with the Zoom conversation and the random breakout rooms and things and continue the conversation. Uh, and if you're here at us in the building, we're going to head over to Christ's Pieces. It's a lovely chance for us to socially distance, but catch up with one another a bit more. Uh, but before we do that, let me pray for us together. Our loving Father, we thank you for the book of Numbers and the picture that it gives of uh, us of the Christian life as a journey. Our Father, we thank you for showing us that sometimes this journey is not easy, it's tough. It feels arid and dry and like a desert, whether that's through just being in a fallen world or the particular pressure that comes with being Christians. But Father, we praise you that you have promised to be with us to the end. Thank you that Jesus says, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And thank you, Father, that when we get there, treading that verge of Jordan, as the song puts it, it will be pleasure and joy unimaginable because we will be with you forever. And Father, we look forward to that. We long for that. Fix that in our eyes as we journey on. In Jesus' name. Amen. Father